So hi guys, uh, what's your names? What do you do in Lenaro? Or outside of Lenaro perhaps? You go first. Huh? Cool. Okay, sure. Then you go so anyway. I'm, <laughs> I'm Paul McKinney. I'm uh, IBM assignee to Lenaro. Um, until recently I led the kernel team. I was very happy that Deepak Sassin has taken it up. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be working probably on, uh, on uh, server architecture, which uh, um, is probably going to cause the usual amount of controversy and pain. I'll be spending some time on, on kernel working with the consolidation group, but uh, the heavy hitters here are, are to our right on that piece of it. <laughs> okay, let's, let's continue with you, Arndt. Uh, I'm Arndt Bergman. I also work for IBM. I'm signing to Lunaro. I work on all sorts of kernel stuff. Recently, I've looked into device driver reviews and uh, a lot of work on trying to optimize for flash media. And I'm planning to help out uh, with the situation we've got in sub-architectures now that we can get the device tree support in and a lot of other things that, that need to help there. And you're the one who removed the... I, I removed uh, some, some blocking <laughs> things. Uh, <laughs> Which has been here for a long time. Hi, Thomas. Uh, anything to say? Who are you? Uh, Yes, Thomas Klexner. I'm working for uh, my own small little consulting company, Linotronics, and I'm part-time contracting for Linero. So I'm trying to help get the sub-architecture problem sorted out in ARM by consolidation. I'm maintaining interrupts, timers, and a third of the x86 architecture. And some out-of-tree patches, which crazy people use. So you're actually manical, you're doing both x86 and ARM. What? You're actually manical, you're doing both x86 and Yes. <laughs> but I'm not going to be an ARM or maintainer. <laughs> <laughs> and who's the third, the fourth guy? Hi, I'm Brent Lightley. I'm a kernel maintainer and I'm uh, working for some work for Lenaro and uh, Ops the CTO. And my focus is on food architecture. So I've been spending time working with Vice Tree and trying to sort out all the bits and pieces that are needed to easily take out a boot media and boot an ARM system regardless of what document hardware it is. Okay, can you touch the device tree? So it's right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, I heard that it's, uh, it's starting to run now on the panda board, is that right? And uh, other boards? Uh, they, they device tree, the core support for device tree is pretty much done. And as of this morning, I heard from Russell that we're going to be able to merge the core device tree support into 2640, which oh. the merge window should open to the middle of the Depending, whether, depending on what, on what the regression is. Yeah, there may be another RC. Uh, so every ARM platform can very easily turn on. It's a trivial patch to do so. And then the next step is to start using it for getting rid of a lot of the duplicated board files where we use C code to describe each platform replace those with data files that describe the same platform and break all of the stuff that tends to be common between these boards into data, which reduces the amount of C code, which reduces the size of the kernel, and makes maintain, should make maintenance simpler. So what, what do you need at boot time? Do you need a, a special bootloader? It's, a modified bootloader? Like, it, no. it is a modified bootloader. No, not it's, necessarily. Well, see boot. And yeah, but you can, you can uh, boot a, a kernel with the device tree attached as well. So you yes, that's right. There's uh, there's patches that allow you to oh, yes. a new kernel on an old bootloader. And then that works great. You don't have to replace the firmware to do so. Because there are boards where yes. we actually can't replace the bootloader. That's right. And that's one of the core requirements is we don't want to break old stuff with the right. new stuff. So you have the, the the device tree attached uh, to the kernel as uh, in the same way an intramfs is attached like in a dedicated section yeah it's actually we've got a, a very cool patch that does this that you take a z image and if the z image is loaded into the kernel as is it just it, is, it passes the a tags through the way it normally works but if you concatenate with a straight dd the device tree blob to the end of the z image the z image will see it will load some of the a tag values into the device tree and move kernel which is really nice because that means your installation of the kernel consists of copy the kernel into a flash, copy the DTB immediately attached to it, and that's everything that you need to, to boot. An old firmware on the new platform. 
Hey, great. Arendt, can you tell us a, bit, a, a little more about your flash media work? Uh, is what's the, the best flash systems for for block storage now for like uh, MMC, SD? So my, my work previously has been to just look at SD cards, USB sticks, compact flash cards, and other storage to characterize what they actually do. So I did uh, I wrote a small tool that I used to reverse engineer the algorithms used in the microcontrollers that are integrated on the cards. And I find I find <coughs> out characteristics that are all the same about all those cards. Some some of them do some very interesting things, but basically they all do the same things. And now that we have this, we can. Our, our next plan is to look at how file systems will work on each of those cards. So instead of trying out how fast is this file system with this, this card okay. specifically by, by running it, we can now take block trace and um, of, of a system running with a given file system and then simulate what that block trace would do to a given card. And then we can make comparisons. Uh, we are looking into file systems XT2, XT4, XT3, uh, ButterFS, LogFS, and NILFS2. My Sweet. feeling right now is ButterFS should help a lot. NILFS2 is probably even better. Um, XT4, we might want to invest a lot of work into making it just as good or even better than ButterFS. Uh, do you know about what's going on with LogFS, by the way? It's, I, I know it's, a, it's MTD, but it seems that nobody's <laughs> maintaining it. Yes, I, so, LogFS works on both MTD and block ah, devices, okay. so we can actually use it. Um, unfortunately, the design of LogFS uh, was meant for MTD devices, and but at the time when Jörn designed LogFS, uh, and I helped him out a little bit with that, we didn't know the specific characteristics of SD cards. And it turns out that it uh, will work on very few of them perfectly because we need to have 12 erase blocks open at a time. And most of these SD cards can only have six, and that means it doesn't run well at all on most of these devices. But okay. We'll see. I mean, it's still that, that's at least the theory. It may, may work much better in practice. My current hopes are more for the other file systems because right. there's a lot more development going into yeah, them. Yeah. Log of this. The main problem with log of this is it's pretty unmaintained. Well, yes. So you're right. doesn't really yes. Uh, time uh, to. Uh, I'm finding right. some. Uh, Sick faults and I mean, uh, yes. Oops, there are yes. some odd places in there. The, the design idea of LogFS is really, really good, but there's no one really working on improving it and fixing fixing the bugs that come up. We're, we're seeing some of the mainstream file systems showing up on and Android has adopted EXT4, I believe. Yes, and Google is putting a lot of work into making EXT4 better for Flash, and <coughs> I hope to work together with them and with people in other companies like IBM outside of Linaro improving that, um, making XT4 really good on Flash Media. Yeah, the input is not going to use it for the FS. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee that MTD will go away in, the, in today's systems um, and replaced by eMMC or external I media mean, storage? Yes and no. Um, there's, there's a general move from MTD to eMMC, but that doesn't mean that it's going away completely. So, I guess MTD in today's form will mostly go away. It will be still there, but it will be rather irrelevant. What's going to happen is that uh, a lot of um, more intelligent flash controllers, which allow you still access to the raw flash, will show up, uh, and, and they are around already. So, but we have to write a totally different driver model for them, and then um, use UBI on top of it to, to do the take care of the real leveling and, and, and all things like that. UBI is pretty perfect in that regard. Um, there is a project uh, coming up uh, or some work going to be done on UBI for making UBI fast and good, checkpointing. So you just have to scan uh, this kind of super block and then go so that's something which is carried out in the next couple of months. And then uh, I was talking to a few people here already. Uh, they, they really want to have a, a, new, a new NAND um, interface, which uh, actually takes care of the, of, the, of the design of the new uh, flash controllers. What are those new ones? What are they called? 
Oh, um, I have no idea. Um, usually they are embedded in, in, in some, some uh, uh, system on chips. So they, the, the characteristics are they can queue commands, they have EMA transfer, um, they have hardware um, error, error correction and things like that. So that. Is that not uh, no, 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 no. And that's the cool thing because uh, UBI is, is pretty, pretty good at uh, in, in bad block management and real leveling and gives you the resize of the volumes and all these kind of things. Also for um, uh, updates of um, when you do software updates, it has mechanisms which are transaction safe, power plane safe, and things like this, which is very interesting for for embedded stuff. Where you don't want to break your device while updating it, um, but uh, we don't have the MTT is rather bad at dealing with those kind of, uh, yes. controllers where we can actually can do commands or can have a command running which is erasing a block uh, in interleaved designs, erasing a block here and, and reading data from there, which is possible by the by the by the physical design, but we uh, we have no support for it in MTD, and retrofitting this in MTD will not work. So it's MTD, the MTD there as it exists now, makes assumptions that only one command is going to be in flight at a time, yes. which doesn't match with the new hardware that's coming out. Correct. Right. It's also completely synchronous, so um, you, when you queue a command to MTD, you have to wait until it's done, and there are some patches to, to fix to fix them. Patches have been around for a long time, but they never done much. Yeah, and and, and the, the problem is because the design of, of MTD is so so backwards. Yes. Uh, <laughs> doing this in MTD, and I, and I talked to to David Woodhouse about this, and he will, he agrees. It's just not making sense, and. I mean, we have to, to face the fact that more flash is, is going away, more or less. And if it's here, it's just small, good, good, good flash. And NPD is good for more flash. And, and we, yep. can, we can keep it for more flash and for data flash and this all kind of weird things NPD supports. But for the for mass storage stuff with intelligent controllers, which still allow you access to, to NAND flash, and it's only NAND flash, what matters is the master uh, There we want to have a separate system, which, but, which also utilizes UBI. And we looked into this, and UBI itself is, is, is a rather in, it hooks on top of MTB right now, but it's rather independent from MTB. And we can do very, very easily multi queues and, and Things like that. We should yeah. probably have the block device target on top of UBI. So yes, I was yes. going to ask this. So, yes. is, is that available? So, so, no, it's not available. But um, UBI BMK UBI was allows you to do a, a very simple and efficient block device design on top. Nobody ever implemented it. Which, which is strange. Mm. I mean, the, yeah, right? yeah. exactly. The, 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 the UBI plus on top. We had UBIFS on top of it, which is really good file system, uh, very well maintained, and um, the coming up with a, with a reasonable block device is only interesting if we fix the underlying bandwidth problem. Mm -hmm. So ideally, I think we should get to the point where you can plug uh, NAND flash UBI on top, make a block device out of it, and export that over um, to like US, USB 3.0 uh, uh, gadget and have an SSD that, that works just as well as a really, really expensive $500, right. like $1,000 yeah. uh, that, that you're looking Linux embedded in an SSD. Like Linux <laughs> embedded in an SSD without any, any uh, third party software on top. Right. Oh, yes. Right. Oh, yes. Sounds a good idea. So, so, but, but for this, <laughs> for this, we really need to, 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 to have this underlying change of how we access NAND flash. You did, and it, and we, we don't want to go there and make it deal with all the oddball um, uh, 
uh, interfaces which are not using an, uh, a real intelligent controller. It's a new, it should be a new driver system for intelligent controllers and right. not for not the kitchen sink to solve for everything <laughs> in the world, which is MPD right now. Right. Okay, uh, Paul, would you, would you like to add uh, something about ARM service? Yeah, Let's, sure. uh, I, can, uh, I should be able to get it pretty upset. I can, I can talk about UFI and what you're still doing. Uh, are, are there any 64-bit uh, 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 chips avail uh, available in the foresee foreseeable future? Um, that would be better directed at the ARM folks. And uh, I think there's some people are making noise about that in the press, but uh, I'll let them make their own noise. I mean, the noise was there since 2003. Yeah, it's been, it's, it's been in attention for a long time, so I guess the surprise would be not if anybody's talking about it, it really happened, right? Uh, the uh, thing that's kind of interesting, I think, that it, uh, is, doesn't get the attention it should, is the extreme low end. So we tend to think of taking a box that has Intel or power, maybe a mainframe, and putting out the CPU and plugging in an ARM CPU. Okay, that's not a bad thing to do. But the thing is, is that uh, while we're talking about doing that and maybe experimenting with it, we have people in various parts of the world who are taking things that look like smartphones and using them for some purposes for which you would normally get a server. But let's face it, if you're in some rural uh, country where your turnover is maybe $5,000 a year. I mean, in, in some parts of the world, that's really good. You're doing good here if you can pull them down to a business. You're not going to buy even an Intel server. You're not going to buy a mainframe for that, for sure, right? I mean, I'm with IBM. I love them. And you're not going, going to pay the power bill for those. That's right. Not only that, but you probably get power, if you're lucky, you get 20 hours of power a day. And you don't get to predict when it's not there. Or maybe you try. Maybe you got astrology or something. They're good at that in those countries. I don't know. Haven't, haven't, didn't think to ask that when I was there. So having a smartphone-like device, which has a battery to can write out three to five hours of power, it should, you know, if you don't have that, maybe you shouldn't be applying for your, a job as a server in those markets. <laughs> the other thing is the uh, cell phone interface. We're used to servers, you know, a server, plug an internet, an ethernet, maybe have Wi-Fi, right, but usually plug an ethernet in. Well, okay, so during those hours when the power's out in the day, uh, have, you got bat have you got battery backup for your network inter infrastructure? Uh, has your ISP got that kind of backup, right? Yeah, probably not. Maybe they do. Probably not. On the other hand, in most countries, in most locales, all the cell towers have a diesel generator. And so cell connectivity is pretty close to 24-7. There are some geographies where threats from certain militias uh, make them turn off at night and things like that. But uh, if you're operating those areas, you've got other problems. So why is this important? Well, one of the things is that uh, a server that has these capabilities, a server based on chips that has these things, ARM has that sort of stuff in space, is something that work well in those areas. But who cares? I mean, these things, you know, a $50 smartphone, you know, it's, it's not exactly going to light up the eyes of executives, and certainly not at IBM, perhaps not at ARM either. Thing is, is that what we've seen over the past, over my lifespan, which as you can tell, my hair color is longer than average in this conference, is a, it, it, throughout the world, there are places that were total basket cases when I was a kid, you know, where they couldn't, they didn't even have enough to eat. They weren't even guaranteed food. And now these people are, are driving SUVs. In, not all of them, of course, but a lot of them. They uh, go, to, go to schools, they have uh, IT type jobs. And that will continue. All right? And when they move up, you know, they will move up. And they'll be looking to where they got their first server from for the duck. So it's something that's is important. In addition, uh, there, will, there will need to be an interface between that sort of infrastructure and more classic sort of infrastructure. In these, in these countries, there are places where you can get reliable power, where you do have reliable connectivity, and you need to be able to interface cleanly to that. And again, having servers that span the, the gap between the smartphones and the classic servers, which again, you can get SLCs and ARM just do that right today. And people are using ARM. So I think that's, I think there, there is a lot of effort needed in a lot of other places. So for example, uh, you run an open source stack on, on ARM, but you may find today that there's assembly language for some other popular servers, and ARM is just using C code. Well, we're working on that, we're continuing to work on that. You may find that certain interpreted languages don't have quite as good a support. I mean, you can run the language, but it's not jitted, or the jit isn't as high quality, or not as heavily optimized, and that, that needs a lot of help. Oh, yes. uh, you may find oh. if you have interest in proprietary ISVs, you may have to look at cross-site if you suggest that they port ARM. But I think that's a fixable problem, especially if you take advantage of very large volumes that are there at the $50 end of the market this happening today. If there's nothing quite like bludgeoning an ISD with their own business case, that, that works well. Uh, just going and whining and pleading, I've 
but I've been in several companies where we've tried doing that and it works all that well. So uh, that's uh, and there's another area where home students are at least thought of to be helpful in the in the well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that ARM should restrict itself to this low end not no. at all. I'm just saying that uh, we should ignore. No, it's it's still it's, low, it's, a, it's, it's still low end. It's still low end stuff where where they want to to have instead of having brutal machines on a large box, mm -hmm. they want to have. A really small box several, that's what they need. several nodes on a, on a, on a, in a high density rack where they can power down nodes very efficiently. And where the, and where the power of performance is really, really good. Yes. Which you can currently get with our servers. So, yeah. so, yes, that's right. There are multiple segments. What I talked about is the one that I'm not seeing people talk about much, which right. is why I'm talking about it. But yeah, uh, that you can segment it in much different ways. There's the classic servers. Why not plug an ARM in places some other CPU to make it work? That's, that's, that works fine. Uh, the, the power performance that ARM gets is uh, something that's really, really effective for certain kinds of workloads. You get a large number of integer operations per lot, uh, more, quite a bit more than you can with most other, especially if you design the thing carefully. I mean, it's really easy, of course, to have and, a really and efficient and CPU and then pull the power savings in the And you can very efficient power them, power, if you move them into very, very low power states, which comes yes. from a mobilized base. And, and if you think about blogger sphere, if you are able to consolidate the blocks which are only clicked once per month onto a node which is almost always in, in, in low deep suspend, nobody cares about that 50 milliseconds delay for that block which is only, only clicked on once a month. So because that's the normal delay you have anyway. So. The, the other thing that's, uh, that is really interesting all this stuff is uh, tying it all together, but also the fact that uh, just the change. I mean, I'm a server guy. I've been doing high-end servers for almost 20 years now. Actually, more than 20 years now, I guess, as time does fly. And uh, over the last 10 years, I thought I knew about power efficiency. We've done a bunch of, I've maintained RC in the Linux kernel. We've done a bunch of stuff to RC to make sure it didn't unnecessarily wake up processors. So about a little over a year ago, I got this angry call from a guy that had a dual-core battery powered. He wouldn't tell me what it was. He wasn't close to LQML because it was a secret. But he was really angry about how RCU would waste a few milliseconds of keeping one CPU at high power. And I was going, well, who cares about a few milliseconds? And that's a key thing. You see, if you come from server world, you may have power, you, you probably do have power efficiency as a hard requirement. I'm here to tell you that in the embedded world, battery powered embedded world, it's not merely a hard requirement, it's a fundamentalist religion. And so if you've just been in the server space, you don't understand what people well, but, but, uh even in the server space, uh, people are concerned about it nowadays because the data centers grow and grow and grow, which means you need more power to go in. And the bad thing news is uh, you need as le at least the same amount of power to run the servers to get the heat out That's of the right. data center, which is uh, well, a lot of inefficient <laughs> as, as well. It depends on how you structure it. One of the things you can do is um, if there's water cooling, then the pumping of water is quite cheap. And can move a huge amount of water, uh, heat with water. But there's a reason why some of the data centers are going up in strange places like the Dallas, Oregon, which used to be an aluminum plant. Have, have you ever seen what the aluminum smelter looks like? I mean, it's, it's basically does electrolysis on oxide. And there'll be an electrode that's bigger in diameter than Thomas is tall. And that's saying something, okay? Uh, and so, you know, these guys, what can happen? These guys have 50 year, 100 year power contracts and power company at a favorable rate. And at some point around the 70s or 80s, it became more profitable to resell the power than to make aluminum. And so what we're seeing is some people putting servers there to take advantage of those long-term contracts, buy long-term contracts, and go from there. But it's uh, the other thing that was a real surprise to me, and I don't know if we can make this with the server if you want or not. There are devices that while they're operating, MP3 players, while it's playing music, will be using less average power than the lowest possible running state for the CPU, on state for the CPU. In other words, most of the time, while it's playing music, the CPU is powered off, not a little power, you know, shut down, not executing instructions, not doing anything. And one, my first thought is, well, you can't do that in server space, but you know, if we can, we ought to, right? Maybe we can. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting discussion. <laughs> and uh, enjoy the rest of the UDS. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.